and good morning, everyone. Welcome to the show this morning. This is Education, Leadership, and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving. My name is Andrew Murata, and I am the principal at Port Jervis High School, and welcome to show number six. The tunes are a little different this morning, and that is in honor of our guest uh, who will be coming on in our second segment. That's Andrew Myra. Andrew is a teacher, he's a business owner, and he's a Division One we- referee, and uh, he loves that disco music, so we have uh, some some tunes on this morning we don't normally have on the show in honor of my friend Andrew. Happy to be back uh, uh, in the studio here recording Education, Leadership, and Beyond. Uh, was away for a couple of weekends, um, and uh, my opening concept is going to be about communication, but before we get to that, I do have to just comment, we went out west to Colorado and Utah with my family. Uh, We rented an RV in Kansas City, Missouri, and drove west, and those national parks were just breathtaking. I'm in the studio here with my man, Gavin Burt. Gavin, have you ever seen the national parks out west? Have you ever been out that way? I've been out that way. I just don't know if I've seen any national parks. Uh, Usually when I go out west, I just like being on the highway. I've driven through central Nevada, which is the loneliest road in America. I've been through Idaho, New Mexico. I mean, I've been in 41 states alone. Holy. Yep. Well, and, uh, uh, those national parks out there, just breathtaking. So for all the listeners out there, you know, whether you're an RV person, whether you like to drive, whether you have kids, grandchildren, you're going by yourself, that is something that I would recommend you get out there and see. Uh, you could pick the national park. Some like the, the namesakes, you know, uh, um, the Yellowstone National Park or the Grand Canyon. We went to places like Mesa Verde and Arches National Park in Moab, Utah. Just unbelievable. And, and if you haven't seen them and if you're at home listening to the show here on Saturday morning, Education, Leadership, and Beyond, and we're on Country 1077 WDLC, 106.9 WYNY, and Wall Radio. If you haven't seen those, I would go on Google Images Type them in there. Type in Mesa Verde National Park, the Great Sand Dunes in Colorado, and uh, uh, Arches National Park. And, man, just breathtaking. So uh, I did want to start the show with that. I had a great time with my family and really uh, reinvigorated me to feel proud about the United States of America. And, man, we live in a beautiful country. So, uh Uh, Check out those national parks. But my concept for today's show, and and again, education, leadership, and beyond, it is just about that. It's about education. It's about those leading the way and and those outside of education. And and my guest today, Andrew Myra, who will be coming on in our second segment, he is um, a great communicator. Andrew's a good friend of mine. I know him for over 20 years. And he's a great communicator in all of those avenues. In his school, uh, JFK in Patterson, New Jersey, he's an English teacher. In his business, Twins Window Cleaning in Staten Island, New York, as he runs his own business. And as a Division I men's basketball referee, he communicates. Um, so I wanted to go over a couple of things regarding the importance of communication. Communication in your lives in your relationships with your family and friends, in your work. Think about where we are in the year 2017 with all the technology that's out there. And uh, it still boils down to your relationships with people. We certainly can communicate differently these days. Uh, There's so much out there and different ways to do that. But think about the types of communication in your life, whether it's with your spouse Again, close family members at work. You have face-to-face communication. You have old-school phone, texting, email, letters. When was the last time you've gotten a written letter from somebody? And then the social media, uh, Twitter, 
um, and, and Instagram and all these different uh, social media apps and ways to communicate. LinkedIn and, uh, you know, one of the most popular, Facebook. So in reflecting about today's show and thinking about it as my role as principal and myself as a, as a Division One referee also, communication is key. It is so important. Uh, we've been interviewing this summer, and that's something I, I love to do. I've talked about with some of our past guests, uh, Mr. Bon Jovi, the superintendent, and Mr. John Bell, the superintendent at Delaware Valley, in terms of interviewing how important it is. But think about that conversation when you meet somebody for an interview, whether you meet somebody at a party, whether you're looking to date them, you're interested in them. Think about that face-to-face conversation and that face-to-face communication because that's something we're getting away from with all the technology. We are getting away from it. But think about the dynamics that happen, whether it's a meeting, again, a joyful meeting, someone you're enjoying and uh, it's company, or it could be a, a difficult conversation at work. What happens in that face-to-face conversation? Think about posture. Think about eye contact. Think about hand gestures. Think about the speech that the person is using and the tone of voice. All those are extremely important. And, and not only the words you're saying, what about listening? the active listening on the other end. You certainly know as a teacher, as an educator, if your audience is getting it, you, you, you understand that. I talked about last week uh, the seven habits and, and habit number five, seek first to understand, then to be understood. I talked about body language, how we say what it is we're saying, and then the actual words. In uh, reflecting on that and studying about that, the, the, in communication, 55% of the communication is body language. 38% of it is how we say it, and 7% are actually the words. So you think about posture, eye contact, gestures. Those are all an extremely uh, important part of your communication. So whatever it is your role, a parent, a child, a student, an employee, whatever your role is out there, it's so important, uh, communication, and and to to work on those things. With texting and Twitter and and the new generation of technology out there, uh, we are finding young people are, are losing that skill of communication, are losing the ability or the, or the skill, really, to conduct themselves appropriately in face-to-face conversations. Um, in doing a little research about today's show, I have found uh, that companies like J.P. Morgan and Coca-Cola have offered employees to, to drop their voicemails because they are texting so much. And uh, in a recent article I found... Only 6% of the employees at a local uh, Coca-Cola had decided to keep their voicemails. And uh, a majority of the employees at J.P. Morgan did away with voicemails. Most of the people are texting. And think about the people in your life and around you. Are you calling them and leaving them a voicemail? Or are you just shooting them a text? I mean, I have some financial people I work with and things like that. Uh, You know, shooting that text is, is almost faster. Um, but also people are like breaking up with people, uh, via text and things that should be happening face to face, uh, are happening, uh, uh, text messages. And, uh, I just don't, I just don't know about that. Um, but it is important. And as an educator, as a principal, that connection and that communication with teacher to student, with principal to, uh, teacher, Those are face-to-face conversations, and part of my role to make sure that uh, we don't lose that type of communication, and and I want to be great at it. Certainly coming on the air, uh, having this radio show, a a couple of people have advised me to really listen to the words that I'm using, really listen. Uh, My man Gavin Burt is here taking care of me in the studio, and I have the headset on, and I could hear myself talking, so... It really is making me focus in on the words um, 
uh, that I'm saying. So, again, my opening point today, be a great communicator. Whatever the role is that you are, are serving in your family, um, in your job, be a good communicator and think, are you using the appropriate type of communication? When you write an email, are you angry? Are you mad? Are you trying to prove a point? And is that something that should be done over email? Going back to, again, last week's show with Dr. John Bell talking about the seven habits. We talked about being proactive, thinking win-win. And again, seek first to understand, then to be understood. And and it goes back to that last habit. Uh, your listening skills is such an important part of the communication. So uh, coming up next... We have my good friend, uh, English teacher, business owner, and basketball referee, Andrew Myra. He's going to be our guest on today's show on education, leadership, and beyond, surviving and thriving. We are on country 107.7 WDLC, 106.9 WYNY, and Wall Radio. Hit me up on Twitter, at Andrew Murata 21 a short type of communication. Or you could send me a longer type at email, andrew at com. We'll be right back. Here's a little disco music from my man, Andrew Myra. And welcome back, everybody. This is Education, Leadership, and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving. My name is Andrew Murata. We are on Country 107.7 WDLC, 106.9 WYNY, and Wall Radio. You can follow me on Twitter, at Andrew Murata 21 and you can email in the show, andrew at com. That music coming in, that disco music, you we normally don't hear that on this radio station, but that's in honor of my good friend and guest on today's show, Andrew Myra. Andrew, welcome to the show. Thank you, Andrew. I'm honored. It's exciting to have you on. You and I know each other uh, 20 years, Andrew, and uh, I introduced you in the first segment. You're a high school English teacher. You are a business owner, and you are a Division One basketball referee and my opening concept was about the importance of communication and I've seen you in all those roles uh, and also being a father and a husband to your beautiful wife Nancy and your daughter Eva you know talk to me about the importance of communication in those roles Andrew and how are you so good in all of them uh, as a, a communicator well you know experience plays a major role you know, growing up in a strict Italian household, you you learn when to open up your mouth and when not to. I took that and grew. I met a lovely woman, became a teacher, got married, started a business, started refereeing, and I became a good, 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 very, very talented juggler. Communication is important. Regardless if it's with your wife, a student, a disgruntled parent, a happy coach, or a very unhappy coach. And, and Andrew, you what... Communication it, skills. You, you, go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. Drew, no, sorry. no, you go, you go. Yeah, uh, being a good communicator, you, you really have to figure out the temperature of that conversation is someone else heated where you need to tone it down or tone it up if you are 100% confident in your answer and and where you're coming from you need to step it up but the biggest thing is admitting your mistakes Andrew you know we're going to talk about your business and refereeing in our next segment. So let me shift to you being a teacher, uh, you know, JFK school in Patterson, New Jersey. And, and for all those uh, historians out there, you know, your district, your school district 
I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. I know you know the better details. That was based on the movie uh, back then uh, of the principal. Tell me the name of the movie. It's escaping me. Uh, Lean on me, and the principal was Joe Clark. And, the, and, and I mean, that portrayed the, the difficulties in your school district uh, and, and dealing with, uh, you know, 95% minority. You've been there for over 20 years as an English teacher, Andrew. What makes you successful in that role as a teacher, and and how do you stay in, in such a place that can be so difficult for some to, to work in? How did how did you how did you stay in there and continue to be successful? It is quite challenging. Um, being in the inner city, a low income urban area, you know these these kids don't have much, and if I can inspire them and show them that hard work does pay off it's worth every penny i just had a student write me a note at the end of the year and he's actually going to Rutgers, new brunswick for engineering and he wrote me a letter it still brings tears to my eyes about him being in my freshman english class not so much not being able to handle the work but socially and emotionally he was very unbalanced and, um, you know, I, I, I took him under my wing. I uh, talked to him on his off periods. I went to visit during lunch. And, you know, he writes me this note about if it wasn't for me, he wouldn't be the man he is today. So you really have to lend an ear to these kids. Open heart. And, and realize that these kids don't have much at home half of them don't even want to go home and you want them to come to your class and have fun and learn and andrea you know uh, being an educator here in port jervis uh we certainly don't have uh that big of a hill to climb as you do in patterson new jersey but what type of uh, skills in terms of reading and writing are the high school kids coming to you and how how are you how are you getting them prepared for for college? How how do you do that? It is it is quite difficult. We are a state run district, so the state of New Jersey tells us what to read, what to write, and they're stuffing t- standardized tests down our throat. So they'll tell us what's going to be on a test, and what we have to teach. So if I teach a sophomore English class and 80% of the kids are reading on the 5th and 6th grade level, I pretty much have to tone it down, make it, make it interesting, and hopefully they will, they will remember what I've been teaching them when it comes to test time. So it is quite challenging. Okay. Andrew, you mentioned some of the things you do, and, and you shared that note with me, that young man, and I know that's not the first time you got something uh, like that from a student. You've been voted favorite teacher I don't know how many times. You mentioned some of the things that you do above and beyond, but in your opinion, Andrew, what makes a great teacher and what makes a teacher in a district like yours really stand out and be successful with those students and, and stand out in that staff? Well, you certainly have to love your job. If you don't love what you're doing, it's not worth doing. But it can't. It, can it be hard? Uh, to, can it be hard to love what you're doing when you, when you, you have the, some of the the behaviors that you see in your hallways and some of the fights and some of the, the things that you deal with? How how do you love that? How do you how do you grow to love that? You you have to gain their respect, and you know the, the first couple of months of school, I have to let them know. I'm in charge. You know, they come from single parent homes. They don't listen to mom, grandma, whoever they're living with, and they think they're going to come into the school and do the same thing. So I have to lay down the law the first couple of months of school. And I tell them that they're not going to like me as a teacher, but by the end of the school year, I'll be their favorite teacher. And, And Andrew, you know, last week's topic was about the seven habits. And it was one of the seven habits, as you know, is begin with the end in mind. So are you doing that as a teacher? And, 
and how do you how do you get to that end? How do you earn their respect to those those students that that might be unruly in other classes? I I usually pick on not pick on. I'll 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 know who the troublemaker is. Okay. I'll make him my my teacher's pet. Hand out these papers, collect these papers, log on for me, get on a smart board, get it all going. Because most of these kids act out because they don't get the attention at home. So now I'm giving this troublemaker all the leeway in my classroom. And he sees it and he's like, wow, this teacher cares. And I turn him around. Andrew, how come you never left there? You've been there 21 years. How come you never left? Because I believe I make a difference. When these kids come back and visit and I tell them, make sure after your sophomore year, your freshman year, your junior year, you come back to my class and I want you to sit at my desk and tell these kids what you experienced in my class and how I pushed you to be the best you can be. And they do it every year. They come back and visit and and they talk to my classes. And that impact on those students that are in the current seats must be very powerful from former students. Correct. Yeah. You know, it's all about social media and pictures and likes and dislikes and comments and followers. Log on to your Instagram account. There he is in class. There he is in a library. There he is on campus walking around showing showing videos. This could be your, your, your step to a new life for you and out of the inner city of Patterson. Yeah. And they like that because... Yeah. You know, going on vacation to them is going to Route 46 to Red Lobster. Yeah, I hear you, Andrew. We're up. We're up against a commercial break. I got. I do have one more question before we go to break. You know, you were an, an all-star pitcher on a championship team, Montclair State University. You know, you won a college champion uh, championship. I, I, you wear that ring. It looks like a, a gigantic stone on your finger. You know, what lessons did you take as a baseball player in college? to your classroom as a, as a teacher and, and to the court as a referee? What are some of the things that you, you've taken as an athlete that you use today in your role as teacher and referee? Definitely cooperative learning. You know, I set the best readers up with the worst readers, and I make them learn from each other, just like I did on a baseball field. And this is what I do with younger referees, and I talk to them, and I sometimes you have to let them burn that bridge and it may get worse before it gets better, but they all learn from each other. Okay. What else, Andrew? What else did you take from the field with you? Being disciplined, having responsibility. You have to be accountable. If I'm on a pitcher's mound and my coach asked for the fastball in the outside corner and I threw it on the inside corner and a guy hit a three-run dong, that's my responsibility. That's accountability for me. So when I say homework is due, it's due, regardless of what you have going on. When I say bring in, today, the, bring in that novel, bring in your notebooks, your pens, responsibility. Well, and, that's, and that's, those are great lessons. Uh, and again, you did it at one of the highest levels, winning that championship at Montclair State University. You know, Andrew, uh, we got to go to a break. We had one of your professors on. He was on the first show, Dr. Rob Gilbert. And I believe you actually had a class with Dr. Rob. Is that right? The best. I still call into a success hotline. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And he was on and, and a lot of the ideas. And he pushed me to write uh, my book that I have coming out uh, this fall about the principle surviving and thriving. And that hotline number, 973-743-4690. And that's the success hotline. This is my good friend, Andrew Myra, teacher referee and business owner on education leadership and beyond we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back And welcome back, everybody. This is education leadership and beyond surviving and thriving very happy and very proud to welcome to the show my good friend, Andrew Myra. Andrew is a English teacher at Kennedy High School in Patterson, New Jersey. He runs his own business, Twins Window Cleaning, 
and uh, he's also a Division One men's basketball referee. Andrew, very happy to have you on the show, and I want to shift gears a little bit, Andrew. We talked about your teacher role in the first segment. How did how did you start your own business, Andrew? You're married, you, you, your wife, you, you started a family, and how did you start your own business? What made you get into that? Well, to be honest with you, Andrew, I started teaching. I wasn't making a lot of money. So my twin brother and I, with $200 and two broken ladders, went over to Home Depot, bought some squeegees and scrubbies and razor blades and squirt bottles, went over to my best friend's florist in Staten Island, started cleaning his windows, and a woman walks by and she says, oh my God, you clean windows. My window cleaner hasn't called me back. Do you have a business card? I said, ma'am, I left him at home, but if you give me information, I can come give you an estimate. And in my head, I'm saying, we don't even have a business. <laughs> and sure enough, we went to her house. She told her sister, she told her girlfriend, she told her nail salon lady, her beautician. And from 1999 to the present day, I got about 15,000 customers, about eight to 10 guys working for me. And we do about 200 stores and banks a week. Wow. From $200 and two broken ladders, that's pretty good. And Andrew, we opened the show with communication. So that first conversation right there and your interaction with that lady, you know, uh, shot your business forward. Andrew, you mentioned the estimates and that amount of people, you know, your workflow and going from school to doing the window cleaning and the refereeing. How do you balance all of that, Andrew? How do you make that all work? It was difficult at first, you know, coming home from school, running some estimates, coming home to family life, scheduling people in, cancellations, rain dates, people that want the work done, but they don't want to pay the price. So it, it's, it, it was difficult. But uh, when we built it up, my twin brother and I, since he's a New York City policeman and I'm a teacher, we started hiring help. And no outside help. Family, friends, teachers, firemen, cops, sanitation workers. Because we have to be trusted in people's homes. And I pay my guys a little bit more money. And my price is a little bit higher, but we're trusted. And that's what really makes us grow. It goes back to that old adage, you know, you, you get what you pay for. Andrew, you mentioned about trustworthiness. What's some of the most important things about running your business and and making it grow the way you have? Probably caring. You know, people that want their windows clean, when you walk into their home, their home is meticulous. So you do have to, you know, if I find a new worker, I tell them, is your room clean? Is your house clean? I can tell by the way he dresses. You know what? You're going to be a good fit. He's got a personality. We go into, you know, we're coming into your home with five, six, seven, eight guys. And sometimes it's overwhelming for people. But we take our shoes off, we show them we have personality. And, you know, so, some people leave money and jewelry out on purpose to see if we're going to take it. Take it and, and clean um, it or take it and uh, put it in your pocket? Yeah, no, take it and put it in your pocket. You know, and they leave it. And there's cameras, technology, you know, the tape don't lie. I have a customer who emailed me from the Bahamas. Andrew, I'm going to be home next week. Could you power wash my deck, the concrete around the pool, the four sides of my house, clean my gutters, clean my windows? Here's the code to my garage. I'll send you a check when I get home. And this guy's in the Bahamas. Goes back to that trustworthiness that he trusted you and your company. Andrew, you know, you mentioned about you could tell by a young employee the way he dresses. I know your guys are in uniform and and you have them look sharp. You yourself, I, I know you're in great shape. You're, you know, you take care of yourself uh, physically and, and mentally. Why is that important with your business on how you guys are dressed? Why, why do you think that's important for the success of your business? Because I get so many compliments about it. You know, we have a standard. You're not coming to work with a hat on, with ripped jeans, or, or looking like you just fell off a bar stool. I'll send you right home. And there's a uh, day's pay for them. And now that sends a message to all the other workers. And I do it a couple of times a year. Yeah. And Andrew, we spoke in the in the beginning of the show again about communication, posture, eye contact, and gestures, and that's the type of communication when they when your company shows up. And I've seen your work. You've done my mom's house in Staten Island. You know, I've seen your work. It shows that the company is you care and and that they're going to do a good job because they look the part. And that brings me to my our last portion that I wanted to talk to you about is refereeing and basketball, which you and I share a great passion. Tell me about your basketball refereeing, Andrew, and 
you know, why do you love it so much, and, and how the heck did you get involved with basketball refereeing? Well, I love the game of basketball. I played it all my life. So when I started teaching, my athletic director came to me and said, Andrew, could you uh, referee my freshman game today at 4 o'clock? And I was the varsity baseball coach at the time. I said, well, isn't that a conflict of interest? <laughs> I'm really stuck. I'm really stuck. So I went and did the game. Didn't I knew about the rules, but not as much as I do now. And then the coach from the opposing team says, how do I get you to referee my games? Mm. And that's what just clicked. So I just started doing freshman and JV games. I took the IABO class to be carded to referee varsity basketball. And then it, it took off from there. And it's a very, very good put part-time job from November until March. And it, it works well with my business because, you know, during the holiday season, if there's snow on the ground, this business slows down and refereeing picks up. And when refereeing's end over, it's springtime, and now uh, we go out and clean windows and power wash and clean gutters. And you and I have had the privilege of, of refing a lot of games together, and I tell that story a lot. Andrew Myra, Andrew Marotta from Staten Island, both educators from Staten Island, both Italian, tall, dark, and handsome, and, and people argue, uh, you know, who's more handsome, but uh, we'll leave that for, the, for an argument. But that one supervisor... He said he couldn't tell the difference between us, so he hired the both of us. Remember he made us stand up there in that room? I do. Yeah, and I've actually gotten some calls from supervisors that meant to call you, uh, but I only want them to call me not when there's a problem, but when there's another game to be ref. Andrew, tell me about your decision-making. And again, the opening concept of the show is about communication, and this is education, leadership, and beyond. We are on Country 107.7 WDLC. 106.9 YNY and Wall Radio. Tell me about your decision making and, and your communication with the players and the coaches on the court. Well, you have to do your homework. Depending on where the team's from, where the coach is from, have they just won the last five games in a row? Have they just lost the five games in a row? So you, you can tell by the demeanor of the players out in the court and when you introduce yourself to the coach before the game. And, you know, it's important to communicate. I talked to some of the players before the game. You get a sense of the game, sense of the feel for the players. And, you know, some players are just hello and goodbye. Some players want to chat. And, you know, you, you get a sense of it. You know, depending on the conference, the part of the country you're in, you may be hurt. They may be hurt. So it, it all plays a major role into, you know, the, the communication with with teams. And, Andrew, we've heard our supervisors say so many times it's not necessarily a call that you make that angers the coach, but rather something you said or, again, going back to body language, you turned your back on them or something like that. How do you know what to say to the coach or what not to say and, and when to say it? Tell me about that part of your, your officiating. Well, it, it's my job. I, I the, the money is great. It keeps me in great shape. And you really have to watch your P's and Q's. Some coaches like to communicate, and some coaches don't want to speak to you at all. So you have to get that feel of, of where the coach is coming from. You know, and if the coach likes you and you develop that um, trust with the coach, you still have to be careful because one coach says, I never want to see Andrew Myra in my gym again. Another coach says it. Another coach says it. And I, I won't be refereeing anymore. So you, you do have to take baby steps, especially when there's a new coach. Well, you've taken those steps and, and ran with them. You've done conference championships games. You've done playoff games. Uh, your schedule continues to grow. And I know you're on the doorstep of that NCAA tournament that we've both been chasing. I know it's a goal of ours, but you're not there yet. But I know you're getting close. And, Angie, my last question, because we're running out of time. Again, we spoke about your, your refereeing, your teaching, your job. You know, you have two beautiful ladies home with you. Your wife, Nancy, you married 14 years, and, you, and your beautiful daughter, Eva Noel. How do you make all those things work for you? Now, on top of it, the most important jobs are being a father and a, and a husband. How do you put the, all that together and make it work? It, it comes easy, man. I, I'll be honest with you. Communication in, the, in a marriage is the most important. Society is going a whole different way. Well, and that's you know why we had you on today, Andrew, and that's why we had 
uh, that topic of communication. So, Andrew, I want you to stick around for our call-in or write-in portion of the show. Uh, We have to break for one last commercial. This is Education, Leadership, and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving. This is Andrew Murata. You can follow me on Twitter, at Andrew Murata 21 and email in the show. We'd love to have your question on the show, andrew at neversinkmediagroup.com. We'll be right back with our guest, Andrew Myra. And welcome back to the show, everyone. This is the last segment of Education, Leadership, and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving. My name is Andrew Murata, and I'm happy to have uh, my good friend back on for our last segment. And this last portion of the show is is your questions, your write-in questions. You could send them to me on Twitter, at Andrew Murata 21 or you can email in the show, Andrew at Neversink Media Group. Dot com. And so we have two questions here for Andrew. Andrew is a, a teacher for 20 years uh, in Patterson, New Jersey, Kennedy High School, uh, English department. Andrew, the first question we have is, what is the one thing that you think holds students back the most in being successful at school? I think it's the uh, peer pressure of, of wanting to succeed. Where I'm at in Patterson, it's a vicious cycle of just doing your two possible years of community community college and, and working at a department store. My students need that drive, that force, that determination, saying, you know, I, I can have the world in my, in my hand, and palm of my hand, if I just went to school more often and cared a little bit. And I tell them all the time, guys, go back to college, get your 60 college credits, come back and become a full-time substitute during a day, Make your hundred bucks, hundred and fifty dollars a day substituting, and go back to school at night. Don't give up. And they need that push. They need that push, that drive, and and everybody. They they end up settling. Well, and it's and it's so good to hear that you're one of the people in their lives pushing them. And I know you have had countless success stories. We just had our graduation up here, and approximately two hundred of our seniors walked across that stage and it is so inspiring and, and that's one of our goals. Andrew, what advice would you have for parents that might be listening on a summer Saturday morning or any students that maybe are sitting around the kitchen table Saturday morning listening? What advice would you have for parents or students out there of things that they could do better in school to be to be more successful? Parents, listen to your child. Set out time to sit in the backyard or on a porch or before dinner, after dinner, electronics away and listen. Ask questions, talk to each other, communicate. What's going on? So many things in in this century uh, between social medias and, and bullying. You have to communicate. You end up holding it in and then you're gonna explode. For students, ask questions. So many kids are afraid to ask questions because they're gonna be made fun of, or it's not smart, it's not cool to be smart. Ask questions. You see a teacher in the hallway, talk to him. He's He or she is a human being as well. Absolutely, Andrew, and that brings us back to the, the start of the show about the importance of communication in our roles as leaders, in our families, in our jobs, and. Andrew, I want to thank you for being on the show today. My good friend and and guest today, Andrew Myra, you did a great job, and uh, I appreciate you being on. I wish you the best in uh, your refereeing, your business, and in your school uh, next year, and certainly my best to your wife, Nancy, and your daughter, Eva. Same here, Andrew. Thank you. I'm honored, and good luck to you as well. I selected this quote to end the show, and I think it's pertinent for your line of work and, and for all those listeners out there, and to end the show is... You are not judged on the number of times you fail, yet you will be judged by the number of times you succeed. Uh, You want to grab a pen? I'll repeat that. You are not judged on the number of times you fail. You will be judged on the number of times you succeed. Andrew, that quote goes out to you and all of our listeners out there. I'm sure there's a lot of customers that you didn't get, and there were calls that you might have missed on the court, but it's the ones that you did get that count. So go out there and Make them count. This is Andrew Murata, and this was Education, Leadership, and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving. We are on Country 107.7 WDLC, 
1069 WYNY and Wall Radio. Hit me up on Twitter at Andrew Murata21 and email in the show, Andrew at NeverSyncMediaGroup.com. We hope you enjoyed today's show. My guest next week will be Claire Murata. Yes, my 11 year old Claire Murata. She's going to be our guest talking about leadership, talking about life, and talking what it's like to be a student going into fifth grade. So, again, I want to thank Andrew Myra as our guest today. And everyone, have a great Saturday. Go out and change the world for the better. Thank you. Thank you.